extremely hard to make sure that expectations haven't built up which are then going to be disappointed. And that's a difficult thing for them to do because they know that on the ground, in the hospitals and the schools, there is so much to be done. He, he won't know, but we can um, tell those who are watching that Kettering, which was the Conservative number one target seat to take from Labour, is having a recount. In 97, the Labour majority was 189. So there's a recount. There. So there's obviously a very close outturn there, John. Maybe Colin can come in on that. Jonathan, yes. We uh, can't really tell what's going to happen in Kettering. It's similar to these other tight marginals that we'll be looking at earlier today. I think the interesting thing here, but you remember all the talk about tactical voting through the campaign. Well, tactical voting has been the dog that really didn't quite bark. It, it whimpered in a few places. Liberal Democrats certainly owe many of their seats to tactical voting, and indeed Labour has pinched one or two through the same process. But in these other instances of these very narrow seats that the Conservatives hold by just a few hundred votes, Bedfordshire South West it was a few moments ago, if the Liberal Democrat supporters there had to any degree at all been prepared to tactically vote, then the Conservatives would have been defeated and Labour would have got in. So it's Thank only you. where the targeting and of the, by the parties has gone on that tactical voting has worked. Now there you see that democracy in Britain continues. Where else would you have the Prime Minister who's just won an election at 5.30 in the morning waiting in docile fashion for the lights to change on the A30 in Hatton Cross, uh, delaying his arrival in Millbank. Um, I can think of very few other European countries, let alone any other country in the world, where he wouldn't be given the escort that allows him to go through. And I think quite a lot of voters will say quite right too. It is good that prime ministers live for part of the time, at least, like the rest of us who get clogged up or have to wait at traffic lights. Don't you agree, John? Yes, I think also it's sort of the attitude of the police, really. I think they're always very keen to say, oh, no, we control this bit of it. And I suspect Tony Blair has never been asked about the traffic lights. They just say, this is what we do. And they do it administration by administration. This is the normal way in which a prime minister will travel from Heathrow. And they'll carry out doing what they've always done. But there's, no, there's actually no police outriders there at all. I mean, they're the... They are, unless they've jumped into a secret car and this is another car, a decoy car. No, I think what happens is, I mean, first of all, there's this question of decoy cars. We don't want to go into that too much. But there is this question, too, when they're in the traffic, you'll then find the traffic police will then uh, take over. And that's where it does look a bit different. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I don't know how long it is before he gets to Millbank, which is where we're presuming he goes. He may not. He may go, decide to go back home for a wash and brush up first, but he's, he's due in Millbank. There we are. Uh, news for him, too, um, that Dennis Skinner, veteran maverick, is safely back in. Not exactly a Blairite, John, by any means, but nonetheless now a much-loved elder figure on the front benches who, again, adds a bit of life to the front benches. Yes, and he sort of rather lit up the Commons right at the end of this last Parliament by making it clear how keen he was for Labour to win under Tony Blair's leadership. So there was no question of bitterness there. He, he remembers all those years in opposition, and he likes the fact it's a Labour government, even though people often thought that he was a curmudgeon, and he wouldn't like that because it was the wrong kind of Labour Party. But that's actually not his view. He's, he, he's been a very loyal member, from that point of view, of uh, the Labour team in the last Parliament. There we are. Well, at the moment, on the tally there, you can see Labour has 411 seats, Conservatives 157, Liberal Democrats on 46. We are expecting a Labour majority still of 165. And it is a very big result, as we keep saying, but it doesn't make it any smaller. It is a huge result. And I think now we can go to Mary Nightingale, who's got a roundup of some of these results. Mary. And even at this late stage, or should I say early stage, I can't quite decide which it is, uh, seats are changing hands. Uh, Taunton, we're going to start with a Tory gain here. Now, this was won by the Lib Dems from the Tories in 97, first time since 1922, and the Tories have got it back again. Uh, the Lib Dem victor in 1997 was Jackie Ballard. Now, she was very anti-fox hunting, and some feel this may have played a part in her downfall. There was a swing from the Lib Dems to the Conservatives of 2.2%. The majority for the Tories, though, nonetheless, very small, 235. 
Newark, another Tory gain, marginal Labour seat. This was regained after 18 years in 1997. The Tories have taken this one back as well. Labour to Conservatives, a big swing, 7.4%. Majority for the Tories there of 4,073. Dorset South, this is uh, a Labour gain in 1997. Now, this was the smallest Tory majority anywhere in the UK, just 77 votes, and Labour have taken it from them. With not much of a majority, it has to be said, 153 votes. It's uh, a swing from the Tories to Labour of 0.2%. Now, this was one of the targets of tactical voters, and it seemed to have worked. Also a target of tactical voters, Norfolk North. Now, the Lib Dems have gained this one. Tactical voting really may have played a part in this. A majority of 483 for the Lib Dems here. Swing from the Tories to Lib Dems of 1.5%. And Rumsey, Lib Dem gain again from the Tories. Now this was a famous Lib Dem by-election gain from the Tories in May 2000. Uh, Sandra Gidley won the seat after the death of uh, Tory Michael Colvin with the assistance of tactical voting again by Labour supporters. A big swing from Tories to Lib Dem of 10.7% here. And uh, a gain here for Plaid Cymru, Carmarthen East. This is a Labour marginal seat. This is most vulnerable to Plaid Cymru. They've lost one seat, remember, and they've got one too. Majority of 2,590 swing from Labour to Plaid Cymru of 7.5%. So as you can see, seats still changing hands even at this late stage in the game. Jonathan. In intriguing battle within the landslide. Now we can go. We been watching Tony Blair on his way to what we expect to be his destination, which is Millbank, and we're following that, but at Millbank is Mark Austin. Mark, you were out in the dark earlier on, then you got inside, now you're out in the light. Yes. What do you expect is going to happen in Millbank? Have they given you any indication of what he's going to do when he arrives? Yes, uh, there's several hundred uh, Labour activists gathering here uh, behind me. Uh, Tony Blair, as you say, is on his way from the airport. He's probably driving down the embankment now I'll be watching the sun rising over the Thames there uh, and these activists are getting very excited indeed. Tony Blair will be coming here uh, as he did in 97 on a beautiful uh, summer morning and he'll be coming in and he'll be making a speech along the lines of the other speeches he's made. It's, it's, it will be a speech about what Labour has to do uh, to fulfil the mandate that it's been given by the people. Uh, as you can see now Believe, Thank you very much. Um, Just Tony if you Blair pause a bit, please, Mark, because we've got here the scenes on the plane. We were saying a little earlier, while they were on the plane coming down, when Tony Blair had the little bit of champagne that Bill Neely referred to. Talking now to journalists and to party activists, tea being consumed. We were watching that plane from outside there. You can see Alistair on Campbell the left, Alistair Campbell. And can you identify anyone else there for us? From your lobby That's position? That's Angie Hunter that you can just right see in, front, in the front yes. of the picture. The formidable organizer, long-standing gatekeeper, they call her. She's the one that stops people seeing the prime minister. Look, I or see Alistair yes. Campbell there. We just about miss him on the edge, looking genuinely tired, looking a touch hangdog. Angie looking very happy. That's another of the. That's Joe, one of the Labour press officers you see there in white, and that's Angie Hunter again, with her back to us. They are a formidable, tough group who protect the Prime Minister. Now, that's another press that? officer. You think that's uh, someone very, dressing oh, up? There is, there, there is that quiet moment of reflection as they come down, knowing, of course, the cameras are on them, but just quietly watching, watching as they nearly land, having a private conversation. Clearly, and perhaps understandably, microphones were not encouraged to be close, but... I suppose the lip-readers will know what she is saying, but I don't. Nearly there, perhaps she's saying, nearly there. Yes, I mean, they've... That's the end of those pictures there, John. So he's, um, he is a happy man. And, and, and look who I can see who has arrived. She has been in Edinburgh, in Manchester, in Birmingham. She's flown by plane and helicopter. Somehow she's rushed here even quicker than Tony Blair. How are you? I'd like to say I came in on roller skates. It's not quite true, but it feels like it could have been tonight. I am well. We've had an exciting night. We have had a thoroughly interesting night. And in fact, we saw Tony Blair's plane landing just ahead of us. Just as we 
flew in by helicopter. We could see him land. We could hear on but the air traffic we were wondering, it wasn't your helicopter that was taking the, the pictures of Tony Blair as plane arriving, was it? One very close by, but no, not actually ours. We were very so you've got here, although it landed before you, you've got here before he's got to Millbank. It's pretty good going, isn't it? Well, we had the rather uh, huge advantage of landing rather closer to our studio than he did to Millbank. Did you get a feel, I mean, to be serious, going down through the country, did you get a feel of, of, of the mood? Uh, of, of voters, of people who were activists in both parties? You know, All we parties. really did, and what was surprising, perhaps, after our predictions that Scotland would be perhaps the least enthusiastic area uh, in terms of voter mood, that was where there was a real buzz, and I feel that that was because there was a huge fight going to go on between Malcolm Rifkin and Linda Clark, which of course he lost, but you know, everybody around there, they were talking about it and there was that real sort of interest and enthusiasm, which seemed slightly lacking in Manchester and Birmingham. Interesting areas both, of course, but all the people we spoke to, both in the GMEX Centre, where there were five counts going on from Manchester, and in the International Convention Centre, where there were 11 counts going on, um, people felt that there was a bit of a sense of inevitability about everything, so perhaps not the most riotous of moods. And Birmingham? Yeah, same sort of feeling same. there. Of course, extraordinary, because there'd been so much going on. There were hundreds and hundreds of people around, who mostly it was all over by the time we, we got there, of course. But, uh, you know, great excitement still from the people who had uh, been friends of candidates, friends of winners, workers who were, had had a, an exciting but long night. Uh, but, you know, that, nothing much changed in that particular area. Well, for the full drama, Katie, you arrive here in the studio at half past five, a little yep. bit later than you had said, but here. Thanks very much for taking us on that, on that journey. Um, I think we can go now to Labour Party headquarters again, where people are waiting for the arrival of Tony Blair. Yes, there they are. You can see them all waving their flags, carefully handed out. Um, never miss a chance for a flag. But they're not union flags. Mm. There is that? Ross Kemp from EastEnders, incidentally, there in the, in the middle there. We heard from him earlier on. He's a happy, very stout Labour supporter. John? They're not union flags they're waving, though. It's interesting. Remember last time when he made that triumphal journey up Downing Street to number 10 for the first time, there was this great sea of union flags being waved. But, of course, they had been handed out, as these have, by party workers to enthusiasts. And although people then thought, no doubt abroad, that this was spontaneous excitement from the people of London, it wasn't that. It was a highly organised photo opportunity, as this is, but they've decided not to put out union flags. These are Labour Party flags, There you can see Neil Kinnock just being hugged by Ross, there Kemp. by Ross Kemp. Neil Kinnock, of course, the man, the nearly man, who led the party in 1987, not quite getting there, and 1992 uh, lost and left, now a European commissioner, but has remained... Frank uh, Dobson there. Frank Dobson was... was um, uh, going to be the candidate, was the candidate for Mayor of London, but they wanted Ken Livingstone instead. He was Secretary of State for Health before that, but some people are tipping for, to, to be back on the scene again, John. Yes, people are tipping him as a possible chief whip. Gordon Brown there. Gordon Brown, and yes. Gordon Brown with his aides, and Sue Nye, his office manager, she's there too. I, 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 I saw, yes, there's... Um, the minister in charge of the dome hiding at the back. Oh, there. that's Charlie Faulkner. Yes, Charlie Lord Faulkner. Faulkner. The Prime Minister's extremely close. And Gus MacDonald. And Gus MacDonald, who's been, who's been in many people's judgment a success. He's a, he's a great car enthusiast to the stress of some environmentalists, but he's been a, a good, tough minister. Was a television and producer, became very successful as the chairman of Scottish television, and is in the Lords as Lord MacDonald. And is could become leader of the Lords. Thoughts become leader of the Lords. Could possibly. be. There's Gordon Brown smiling away, talking very, very happily to Neil Kinnock. They've come a long, long journey. That's the point about this. It's, it's different from how it was last time. This is solid this time. And it's hard not Here to Here is the car on its way coming in, on its way to Millbank. Won't be very long now. It can't be very long now. Empty roads. Um, and... He knows what he's going to find when he gets there because this is all very well organized. As you said, John, nothing spontaneous. He will get there and go in and say what he has to say. Yes, it's rather poignant seeing Neil Kinnock, isn't it? When you think of him there as a figure yeah, from Neil the Yeah, Neil Kinnock past. again. 
And yet, I think he genuinely feels that only Tony Blair could have done it. And that but he, he did, in fact... he himself, people shouldn't forget, he himself go. did an enormous amount. Here they're waving, it must be that the car is... No, no, they're just preparing for the arrival. It, perhaps it's a rehearsal for the, <laughs> for the cheering. I mustn't be too cynical about it because the feelings are absolutely genuine, although, of course, it is all... Ian cardiac. McCartney. Ian McCartney, who's a um, senior minister who had a... Cameron Roberts, minister, he's, he's obviously pleased. Very pleased. A tribal politician, if ever there was one, he won't have any question of doubting that it's just a great day for Labour. A lot of those will be the young party workers who were drafted into this campaign, and then they will go back to their other jobs afterwards, having done their duty by the party. Yes, yeah, so all the parties take on extra staff, so this is not the least bit surprising. But many of them, of course, have been involved in this telephone canvassing. It's a feature that goes on behind the scenes, not very much talked about, but quite significant. That's There's why John Prescott arriving. Sorry to interrupt you, John Prescott arriving. Looking very straight-faced at the moment, but I'm sure he'll be laughing a lot more when he meets up with his colleagues. Sorry, carry on, John. No, I was just saying that, you know, Colin Rallings has been talking about how the marginal seats were organised. A lot of it is done by telephone. So that's why, when we see how well both the main parties did in their marginal seats, I think a lot of it's due to that. Now, as the car approaches the headquarters, you can see both. There's the car going on its rather stately way, being very careful to obey the um, rules of the road and not to exceed the speed limit, which is probably about 40 miles um, an hour at that particular point, very steadily. And there, you can see actually yeah, there is a lot of um, happiness on the left, but it is, in comparison with 1997, this time um, four years ago, just over four years ago, it is very different, it's much quieter, there's none of that massive singing, sing-along, much smaller numbers of people, not quite business as usual, but I think there is some music, the Lighthouse family meant to be playing, the, the, there they are. If I think they'll give them a great cheer, I don't think they will be so controlled that they'll be told don't overdo the cheer. I think they will, uh, <laughs> there'll be a rousing welcome. Let's see if we can hear the song being played. Continues, the Lighthouse family and Lifted, singing Lifted, the campaign song away. Gordon Brown looking as though he were enjoying the sound. Lots of young people. There is another minister, Chris Smith. Um, some uncertainty about his future. Some people have suggested he might be um, moved on or out and his department might be dramatically shifted. There again is John Prescott walking in under the, under the arches at Labour Party headquarters. They're enjoying very, it, aren't they? They don't look very tired, do they? The fact they've all been up all night. Well, like it's, the rest of us, John, they're not tired no, either. but I mean, they've been working, haven't they? Uh, they? Yeah, they haven't just been sitting enjoying themselves there. Now he is smiling, now he's there, going in big cheer of applause for John Prescott, who um, fought for Labour, a sterling campaign going round the country, all over the place. Um, luck luckily endeared himself apparently to the voters by his left hook, standing there beside Neil Kinnock again. Lighthouse family still at work. Nick Hucknell on the right there, you can see, just standing there, jogging along a little bit as well. But the person, of course, who's not there, Peter Mandelson. I mean, that must, when I he know. sees these scenes, if he's watching them now, if he's still awake, you must think, and I would be there, but I'm not this time.
Mark, you are Mark Austin. Are you somewhere in there? I think you're in the crowd. Can you hear me? Yeah, I'm just at the front of the Millbank Tower. You're just at the, just at the front. Can you can you see all of this going on? I mean, there's a huge crowd gathering, as you can see. They've been in this party for most of the night. You know, it's interesting. There's this sense of celebration, but it's been diluted to an extent by this low turnout. Now, many Labour activists here have blamed the Conservatives and said that it was their lacklustre campaign, the fact that it was a foregone conclusion. But some Labour people here are acknowledging that all the parties have to in some way engage the public more in the future. And that is something of an issue here given this low turnout. They're looking pretty, pretty happy. There's John Prescott with a really big smile. We were complaining earlier, he was looking a bit sombre-sided, but he's got a really big smile on his face. Now, they're all waiting for Tony Blair, who must be there. Um, Mark Austin was just talking about turnout there. Colin, what is the latest on turnout? Can you tell us? Yes, Jonathan, and I, uh, I think it must cast something of a shadow over this morning, not perhaps the Labour activists, but for others when they begin to think about it. It does now look as if turnout will have fallen below 60% in the general election for the first time since 1918. And that means that despite the scale of Labour's victory, despite this massive majority in Parliament, only one in four electors actually bothered to go to the polls and put their cross in the Labour column. So a landslide by one dimension, but a half-hearted endorsement by some other criteria. I think we can see Tony Blair That's in just a the moment there. The he is coming brain. along beside the river even in that edge there. Long embankment, very close now to Millbank Towers. Thames, of course, on the right-hand side there. Very close to you be there in about three or four minutes would be my guess, John, wouldn't you? That's where the, yes, that's where the Chelsea Flower Show is held. So he's, he were, he's about two minutes away, actually, yeah. or a minute away. He'll be there, and we will then follow him inside. And I think he might make a speech. You see a podium when we were looking at that picture. There seemed to be a, a set up there with a microphone. If, if Mark is still there, Mark listening, I don't know whether you are, you perhaps tell us whether indeed it is planned that he should make a speech. I think you were saying, Mark, earlier that he was going to make a speech. They're waiting, the music's playing. Mark obviously has gone off message. While he goes through, just a note that there was some thought that a, a, a former Conservative cabinet minister, Gillian Shepherd, uh, might be ousted in Norfolk Northwest. In fact, she remains in the House of Commons, having held off uh, the Labour challenge there. And a reminder, too, we're predicting a Labour majority of 165. That's what Tony Blair, driving along the embankment, is driving towards, a 165 majority with something like 412 seats predicted for him in the House of Commons. Conservatives were predicting 167 and Liberal Democrats 52. And Labour is very close to not, the final figure that we expect. And have you noticed, John, we still haven't got a single outrider. There's no motorbikes, there's no sirens going. It's just the Prime Minister quietly going through the streets of London at Warp, quarter to six in the morning. It is, it is very, very unusual. You've been all over the place. I've been quite a lot of places, and you just don't see the absence of of the figures here. Now let's just see if we can see the podium because oh there we are. You see there's a lectern. That's the one they've the star they've had in all their news conferences. You see it just on the right of yes. the screen. Well that looks very much as if it's. He, uh, I, that is, he, I guess he's going to speak from there. Isn't he? Otherwise why he, why have it there? It's yes, got no purpose speak. otherwise. And. Otherwise, the whole thing has to take place within the building. Yeah. But obviously, it's not raining. Why not uh, have him there? Nearly there. Is still there respecting taxi, the a taxi still driver, respecting no doubt, with a bit lights. of advice on how to run the country. If he just yeah, but whoever's in the back of the that window. taxi, looking looking out of the window, would be saying, "Oh my God, that's yeah. that's that's Mr. Blair and Mrs. Blair. Where are they going at this time no, of the morning?" No, I think <laughs> it would be a bit of advice on how to run the country. If I know London taxi drivers, <laughs> a few brief words on what he should do in the next few years chasing along well behind, in any case, as if he didn't quite hear the advice and needs to have it again.
I think it's going to be very interesting to hear what he has to say, and I think it's going to be obviously a great deal of thanks at the beginning. Of There'll course. Be all that formal thanks, and we should expect There's that. There's Gordon but Brown, slightly. There'll also be a message there. too. I think we're going to away. find. Here is the car, now virtually arriving, and there is the car on its way in. They've seen the car, the eruption of enthusiasm. Tony Blair, their leader, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, gets out at the start of his second term of office, and passionate Labour activists are very, very happy. John was saying before that um, this really is his party now. He has done this. Of course, Gordon Brown has played a hugely important part by delivering a secure, sound economy, even, has to be said, in the eyes of um, Labour's opponents. But no one can take it from Tony Blair that uh, he has achieved this along, of course, with close advisers, close supporters. But this is Tony Blair's victory, John. He's always wants to do that, too. There are so many things he wants to change in the Labour Party. He said, we have the courage to change ourselves. That's very much not just a slogan, but a cry from the heart from him, because he feels the party that he joined in the early 1980s was nowhere near his party, was nowhere near this. It's so that's what he's feeling. It's always been interesting why he chose Labour. He, he said he was a man without ideology. He obviously felt he couldn't be a, a, a conservative in, in those days. But he joined Labour, so far as we can understand, although we always find it difficult to look into the man closely, um, despite the fact that it was Labour. Despite the fact it was Labour, and remember in 1983, when he was first elected, anti-Europe, very left-wing, what Gerald Kaufman called the longest suicide note in history was their manifesto, but that was the platform on which Tony Blair first stood for Parliament. There he is. And he obviously didn't like Mrs. the Labour Prescott Party there, he's then. just kissing Mrs Prescott as he passes by. There are the senior figures in the party up the side where I guess he's going to speak, or certainly trying to get a good view. Ah, oh, that's, that's emotional, isn't it? That's Tony Blair hugging Neil Kinnock. Well, he used to say the Labour Party didn't really like him very much. This Labour Party likes him a very great deal. Thank you. Thanks very much, everyone. to all of you is thank you for the wonderful work you've done over the past few weeks. You've been absolutely magnificent. No party could ever have wished for more than what we've had from you. Each one of you have given, well, just fantastic service to the Labour Party and through the Labour Party to the country. Thank you very much. And my wonderful to have John here and Gordon and Douglas and Ian and Margaret and all the team who've done a fantastic amount in this election And we, we shouldn't forget either the man who started the modernisation of the Labour Party, Neil Kinnock. indeed a, a night of history for our party. But the one thing that we have to remember is that now is the time that the people of this country want us to serve them, 
want us to do the things that we promised that we will do. And they want us to be very clear about our mandate here. Our mandate is to carry on the work that we started, to be sure that on the foundation of a strong economy, delivered by a brilliant chancellor, that we end up investing. <laughs> that we invest in our schools, in our hospitals, in our transport, in the police, in our streets. That we make sure that we get the change and the money in that our services need. And then we carry on trying to create a fair and decent society in which there's help for our pensioners, in which young people are taken off benefit and put into work, in which for each and every hard-working family in Britain, we do our best by them. And we know it will be difficult, and we know it will take time, but our commitment is there. The policies and the foundations that we have laid over these past few years give us the ability now to complete the task that we set ourselves. And that task is governed by one simple principle, which is the principle this party today stands for. That we want a society and a nation where not just a few people at the top, but every single person in our country gets the chance to succeed and make the most of their God-given abilities. And we will create that society through a political party today that at long last offers this country a different political choice. For a hundred years, we've been in government for short periods of time, but never won a full successive second term of office. Now we have. But we have done so because at long last in this country, we've united the politics of ambition for yourself and your family and compassion and decency and obligation to others less fortunate than yourself. And that marriage of head and heart is what this party is about. So let us get to our work now, realize in the next few years those expectations are there, we have to meet them, we have to work patiently, clearly, calmly, with determination and vigor to serve the people of this country. It's a privilege and an honor that they have bestowed upon us. Let us live up to it now. So he finishes what is a very short speech and in all honesty, it didn't contain very much. He said what he said before, but he's being warmly um, endorsed for what he said. Uh, difficult, lots to do, will take time, but we can complete the task we set ourselves, take patience, calmness, clarity, They've got a mandate, they want to carry on on the brilliant achievements of Gordon Brown. Um, you can't expect much content, John, um, in a speech like that, and there wasn't any content in it. It was simply, look guys, we've got to work, it was terrific getting here and we're going to stay. Yes, simple joy and emotion, but I think for the party workers that was the suitable speech. You don't want to be too solemn and too serious. He did that in his other speeches earlier in the night, and I think this was a moment simply to bring up some of those emotional themes. It, it, talking about his brilliant chancellor, that was, I thought, a, an interesting moment, making sure that people realized within that group that he knows how much he had to be grateful to Gordon Brown and how much he had to be grateful to Neil Kinnock. Well, they've had to always deal with this question mark of the relationship between Gordon Brown and Tony Blair, and it will be important as we come into, we've talked about it earlier today, this evening, the Euro campaign, because. Gordon Brown is going to be prudent and cautious. It's a cabinet decision. There are different emphases, put it like that. So it is going to be tested, that relationship. There certainly are, and it still remains one of the most intriguing relationships in British politics. You notice how Tony Blair had no difficulty hugging Neil Kinnock, but there was no question of him hugging Gordon Brown. I mean, there, there is a lot going on there that's always fascinating, how close they are, how distant they can sometimes seem, and how much there are moments when you know they have serious personal differences and they have different camps within the leadership. And those camps are only too keen to take pot shots at each other given half a chance, even if the principals don't want that. 
and later today we will see the extent to which Gordon Brown's power may, there we be, can curbed, see Gordon Brown. may be curbed in the reshuffle. There you see Gordon Brown. He will be looking at the reshuffle, not just about his own position as Chancellor, but where are the Brownies? Are there enough of them there? Are they still as strong as they used to be within the higher echelons of the government? And will uh, number 10 try and pull back some of the power that was ceded to the Chancellor to demonstrate that they could run a really effective economy? And at the same time, both men know that they are so much more powerful and more effective if they're united. So they're, they're trapped together in this extraordinary relationship. There they are. He's fighting his way through his supporters, I guess, to leave there and go and get a bit of kip before he has to start on the tomorrow's work. He'll be going on from here to number 10, party supporters, the usual work. You know, this is, this is, this is genuine stuff. We, we, we are obliged to be highly sceptical. This is genuine because these are the party supporters. They fought the battle with him. This is not the British people. It's the party activists of the Labour Party saying thank you and well done to Tony Blair, and he's saying the same thing back to them. And they have, That's a nice sight. A, they have fought a tremendously successful campaign. We can say it now. It's over. Yeah. And these people are responsible for it. It has been, in so many ways, a perfect modern campaign in terms of strategy. Rigorous control by Gordon Brown, great style and flair by the Prime Minister, now back in his car and on his way. And now we can go to Mary, who's in the results centre still, for a final summary of where we are. Mary. It is the final summary, Jonathan. We are almost there. We're predicting a landslide of 167 for Labour. With results in so far, 631, almost there, 413 for Labour, 162 for the Tories, 46 for the Lib Dems, and the rest on 10. And if we look at some of those uh, results and the, the gains and losses overall, Labour are down 6, Tories are up 1, Lib Dems are up 6, and the rest are down 1. So let's look at some of those results then, and we can see that Labour have gained Dorset South. They've gained Innes Mon from uh, Plaid Cymru. They've lost Wire Forest on that independent health ticket, Kidderminster Health Hospital Health Care Concern. Conservative results, Tories have gained Galloway and Nithsdale. That's their only seat in Scotland. They've gained Taunton, Newark and Castle Point. And the Lib Dems, their results, they've gained Norfolk North, Rumsey, Chesterfield and Guildford, thus ending the Tories monopoly in Surrey. And that is the way it looks here, Jonathan. Mary, thank you for that. Your final summary of these early hours. And now to Colin Rallings, you've been following this in intimate detail all the way through as our analyst. What are your final thoughts at five to six in the morning? Is it really that time, Jonathan? It is. Goodness me. <laughs> Well, we didn't quite get to our records. Labour's got a few fewer seats than they had in 97, and the Tories have got one or two more. But where we are, without question, is this is an unprecedented double Labour landslide. Thank you very much. And we are, as you said that, the Labour majority that we're predicting at the moment is 167. John, your thoughts? Tony Blair has simply changed the face of British politics. Not once, but twice. Margaret Thatcher's best result was 144. We're saying 167 in and terms of majority. And we can see now, while you say that, the Prime Minister going back home to Downing Street, into the gates, into Downing Street. Um, he's go, he will actually go into number 11, although he works number 10, he because he took number 11 because of the size of his, of his family. So this is a familiar journey to him, one that he expected no to make. Nonetheless, a happy man that he's done it. And just to say once again, this is the first time a Labour leader has served one full term and is, has the opportunity now to serve another. Look at that. That is Prime Minister and Mrs. Blair going into number 10. Photographers there on the other side of the street almost certainly saying, well done, give us a smile, give us a wave. He's doing it. And there they go, out for the photographs again. Those photographs will whistle around the country. Indeed, they will whistle around the world because the Prime Minister's restoration in power is something that is going to be closely uh, observed. So. Where are we? We've been saying all the way through from the beginning, in our exit poll, we predicted a landslide. It happens that the result we're now predicting is well within what our exit poll predicted. We thought there'd be a landslide, and there was. Um, it is a landslide of extraordinary proportions. Colin was touching on it just now. No Labour leader has achieved this before. 
it is a record that is astonishing in governance in general. It means that it will be extremely difficult for any party, however strong, to, at the next election, give Labour real trouble, except for the fact that it may be that the electorate in this country is now very, very volatile. Meanwhile, we have the Conservatives. You can see there 163 seats in so far. We're expecting that they will end up with 166, one more than they had last time. There's been a few brave sounds. The leader of the Conservatives, William Hague, has looked brave. He's kept smiling, but he said it's a very disappointing night. They know they've got to do some fundamental rethinking. They know that they can't just carry on as they left off. There will be big questions about the leadership. We shall see what happens. The Liberal Democrats, well, they've had a terrific night. 52 seats we are predicting for them, up from their 46. Charles Kennedy, who led a campaign which clearly endeared him to a great many people, and Liberal Democrats have reaped the benefit from that. He was modest, he made his case well. People wonder whether he'd had the resilience to fight the campaign, or whether he'd really enjoyed it. He clearly did, and he did very well indeed. The downside in all of this, which I'm sure is going to be discussed a great deal, is the fact that this turnout in this election has been so low, down to just over 18%. But it's been a great night, and we've been glad to serve you. Now to GMTV. We'll be back at 9.25. Tony Blair arriving in Downing Street just two minutes ago to start his historic second term as Labour Prime Minister. Of head and heart is what this party is about. So let us get to our work now, realise in the next few years those expectations are there, we have to meet them, we have to work patiently, clearly, calmly, with determination and vigour to serve the people of this country. At six o'clock, Friday the 8th of June. Yep, the work goes on. Welcome to GMTV's election special. Well, there we go. They think it's all over. It is now an historic morning as Tony Blair's Labour Party wins a second term in office with a massive majority. Yeah, but what now for the Conservative Party after a terrible night for them? Very disappointing, William Hague said. Is the fat lady singing for William Hague? Uh, Liberal Democrats celebrating, though they look set to increase the number of seats they have in the House. But the politicians were taught a hard lesson as voter apathy kept millions of people at home. It was one of the lowest turnouts of any election ever. Right, let's go to where the action is right now. John Stapleton is where else but Downing Street on this historic morning. Morning, John. Good morning to you, Fiona. Uh, Mr Blair just arrived here in Downing Street about three or four minutes ago in his uh, maroon rover car, pulled up uh, outside uh, number 10. He got out with his wife, Cherie, posed briefly uh, on the steps, waved to the uh, mass array of photographers and cameramen here and went uh, straight back inside. Earlier uh, in the evening, Mr Blair had said uh, it's back to business as usual as from today. No triumphalism, no parties. He says we've still got a lot of work to do. So uh, great joy here in, in the Labour camp, or in the Labour camp at Millbank. 
Meanwhile, at uh, Tory headquarters, I'm afraid, uh, deep bloom. At about 4.30 this morning, Mr Haig uh, spoke in his Richmond constituency. He said the results were for the Tory party deeply depressing. The party would have to redouble its efforts to form a government in opposition. And he said that he'll be reviewing the situation later today. A hint may be that he will step down as leader, but we'll have to wait and see on that front. No word, as far as I know, from uh, Charles Kennedy as yet, but the prediction is that uh, his party may well have more than 50 seats in the House as opposed to 46 in the last Parliament. And the best story of the night, the victory by Dr Richard Taylor up in Kidderminster. He uh, wrested that seat from Labour with a thumping 17,000 majority on the single issue of the opening of, or the retention of, of a local hospital. Huge embarrassment uh, for Labour that, given the fact that they have uh, concentrated so much on the National Health Service in this campaign. Elsewhere, up in Scotland, you remember, last uh, the last election, the Tories were completely wiped out in Scotland. This time around, they've won one seat in Galloway, but Malcolm Rifkin, who uh, headed up their uh, campaign north of the border, he didn't manage to win back Edinburgh Pentland. In Oldham, West and Royton, that's the seat of uh, uh, the Environment Secretary, Michael Meacher, he was up against the British National Party, and the British National Party pulled some 16% of the vote, that in a town that only two weeks ago experienced race riots. And down in Dover, where asylum seekers were an issue, there Michael Howard, the former Home Secretary, held on to that for the Tories. As for the Lib Dems, well, a fantastic victory for them in Chesterfield. They also managed to hold on to uh, Torbay and indeed Richmond Park, which they thought they might lose, Twickenham and a whole belt of constituencies in southwest London, Car Shorten, Sutton and Sheen, and one or two others as well. So deep joy for them. The big question now is where everyone goes from here. The speculation that John Prescott will retain his job as deputy leader but uh, be made cabinet enforcer and uh, Jack Straw will take over his job with transport and the regions. But more on that uh, a little bit later on. Meantime, back to you, Eamon and Fiona in the studio. All right, John, thanks very much indeed. Uh, we're live to uh, Tory headquarters later on. First of all, for a perspective on the whole uh, scenario, Michael Brunson joins us this morning. Hello, good morning. Well, we've been talking about this scenario for months, haven't we? It's very much happened as we predicted, hasn't it? Really? We have, yes. We shouldn't underestimate, though, just how historic a victory this is. It is the only time in, in its 100-year history that the Labour Party has got the chance now of having two full terms of office. And apparently you have to go back to 1865 to find an occasion when a party has had two thumping great wins. So it's good news for them. But on the other hand, all the signs in the electorate are, you know, they're sending out signals all the way around the country to the government saying, well, look, this is another chance for you. I mean, this extraordinary victory by the uh, doctor in Wire Forest, you know, yeah. is, is, is as plain as a pike staff. It's people saying, look, we're prepared to give Labour a second chance, historic second chance and all of that, but get the hospitals right. You know, get the school class sizes down. And so it's really putting Labour on notice. And that is why Tony Blair, I think, was using this phrase, let us get to work. Yeah. He wants to get in there and prove himself. This We've got to get to work on. as well uh, <laughs> this morning. Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, returning to Michael throughout uh, the programme this morning. So, an historic second term. How did they get there? This is the story of the night. Labour had just 43 minutes to wait after the polls closed to win a seat. Sunderland South, the first in the country to declare its result. Labour Party, 19921. And Peter Mandelson was returned to his seat in Hartlepool. He may have been ousted from the higher echelons of the party, but the co-architect of New Labour was passionate in his acceptance of another term as a backbench MP. Well, they underestimated Hartlepool and they underestimated me because I am a fighter and not a quitter. The speeches were banned in Oldham. Officials feared they could spark further racial violence. In the east of the town, the British National Party pushed the Lib Dems into fourth place, taking 11% of the vote. In the west of Oldham, the BNP secured another 6,500 votes. Both candidates wore gags as police looked on. Not everything went Labour's way. In the Worcestershire constituency of Wire Forest, there was a 58% swing against Tony Blair's man. It wasn't the Lib Dems or Conservatives who took the seat. Richard Taylor, Independent Kidderminster Hospital and Health Concern, 28,000. But a doctor campaigning to save the hospital in Kidderminster. I think this is an absolutely unique experience for me and really all of us here. I'm absolutely 
thrilled, honored, and deeply touched that people have held faith and belief in me. That's not how most conservatives felt. Even before William Hay conceded defeat, senior party Very members knew they had a disaster on their hands. It should lead us to a period of reflection. I hope that nobody will say anything hasty in the coming hours and days that any of us might wish to regret thereafter. Amongst other problems to be addressed, one that affected every party. Politicians from all sides in agreement that something has to be done to reverse the huge decline in people wanting to cast their vote. So that was the story of the night. Here's the state of play as you wake up now on this um, Friday morning. State of the parties, Labour on 412 seats, Conservatives 160, Lib Dems in 46 and the others making up those 10. Michael, what do you think? Well, for each of the parties, they know that they've got some things to sort out. Um, Labour's got to deliver this time on getting public services right. The Conservatives are in a terrible, terrible mess. Because although people are being nice in the Conservative Party and saying William Hague fought a good campaign, well, he, you know, he, he didn't plainly because he was addressing the wrong things. Voters didn't want to go on the issues that he went on. There was a 1% swing campaign. to him, wasn't there? I mean, let's be positive. <laughs> 1% <laughs> yes, but you know, it is a very, very bad result for him. What happens to Mr. Haig personally? I think it's going to take some time for it to be sorted out, but in my own view, he will in the end have to go. All right, he says he wants time to reflect, doesn't he, which is uh, interesting. OK, let's catch up on the rest of this morning's news now, because there is other news this morning. Here's Penny. Thanks very much, Fiona. Good morning. Seven children have been stabbed to death, and at least 20 others have been injured, some critically, at a school in Japan. A man armed with a knife forced his way into the school in the city of Osaka shortly after classes began. Reports say two children were killed immediately and five others died in hospital. Three teachers were among those injured. It's not clear what the motive was for the attack. A 37-year-old man was arrested at the scene and is being held by police. The Oklahoma City bomber Timothy McVeigh has lost his last bid to avoid execution and says he's preparing to die on Monday. Last night, McVeigh lost a second appeal to delay his death by lethal injection. The judge said that although the FBI had failed to hand over 4,000 documents at McVeigh's trial, it did not change the fact that he was guilty. Three England soccer fans have been given sentences of up to 15 months in prison by a Greek court, but they are being allowed to return home. They were held in Greece as the players arrived back following Wednesday's World Cup qualifier, which England won 2-0. The fans were allegedly involved in disturbances before the match. They were released after they appealed and are now due back in a Greek court at a later date. Michael Barrymore has reportedly flown to a clinic in Arizona for what's described by his manager as intensive treatment. Earlier this week, the star was arrested and then released on suspicion of using and supplying drugs. It followed the death of a man at a party held at Mr Barrymore's Essex mansion two months ago. There's been a massive drop in the number of men who die from testicular cancer. New figures show the UK has had one of the biggest drops in death rates in the world, a fall of more than 70% over the last 25 years. Experts say the death rate has fallen because of early diagnosis and treatment. The actress Amanda Holden has won an injunction against a tabloid newspaper, preventing it from publishing any more pictures of her sunbathing topless. Yesterday, a series of long-lens photos appeared in the Star, which were taken while she was holidaying at a Tuscan villa with her husband, Les Dennis. Ms. Holden claims it was an invasion of privacy and says she wants the photographs destroyed. A family in Windsor planned to leave their home today to escape a giant spider which they discovered in a bunch of supermarket bananas. The spider, which they believe to be a tarantula, similar to that one there, is still at large after jumping out of the fruit bowl a week ago. All attempts to catch it so far have failed. Time for a quick look at today's weather and there'll be some showers across many coastal areas of Scotland and Northern Ireland this morning. Those will move inland through the day with some sunshine in between. Temperatures will still be on the cool side for many areas, re reaching highs in the north of only 12 Celsius, but up to 18 Celsius in the sunnier southeast. And we'll have a full weather forecast for the weekend with Claire at around 6.30. That's 11 minutes past six. I'm back at half past. Here are Eamon and Fiona. Thanks Thank very much, much indeed, Penny. Penny. Uh, without further ado, we're heading off to uh, Smith Square, uh, which resembles uh, a wake pretty much this morning. Sue Jameson, we've been hearing. Morning to you. Yes, Chief Funeral Director. <laughs> <laughs> That's 
about right, I think, this morning. You know, they were just so optimistic all the way through, saying that the opinion polls were wrong, talking about a fresh start and what they do for their first 15 days in government just at the start of this week. And I can tell you, inside that building right now, it's as though a big black cloud of depression has come to live for a while. Now, of course, it's William Hague who's been buoyed up all the time, even those closest to him perhaps been a little askance at some of the issues they've campaigned on, have at least praised him for his optimism, uh, for believing that it could go on. He took perhaps a little longer than some of the people in here to realize just the scale of what was happening. I suppose we got the first indications really when he called uh, Tony Blair at around 3.15 this morning to concede defeat, and then he drove to his constituency in Richmond, where of course he knew he was going to win. But I think it was probably a more sober message from William Hague than we've heard during the last five weeks. We are privileged to live in a democratic country and we must respect the verdict of the voters and listen to what they have said. It must be a sobering lesson for all parties uh, that millions of people have been reluctant or have refused to participate in this election at all. And of course there will be much to reflect on uh, for the Conservative Party. Now, that's the key. There'd be much to reflect on. What's he talking about here? Actually picking themselves up, starting all over again, different policies, or is he talking about his own position as leader, which at the moment, no one's saying very much about, but I suspect that's what we'll be talking about for the next few days. He's due to arrive here in about three quarters of an hour. All right, Sue, Thank thanks very much indeed. Well, he said there uh, we should listen to the verdict uh, of the voters. Michael Brunson, the voters um, said they didn't trust them on health, education, transport, or policing where do they where do they go now well there's another problem too i mean they obviously did not take to william Hag at all and all the polling suggests that one of the problems was that not only was the message wrong but the messenger too was just not to the public's See, taste we've, we've talked about this before and I suppose we can talk openly about it now he's a very personable guy isn't yeah, he? that's the he, thing i mean every time he comes in we say to him he's a nice he's a warm guy he's witty he's yes funny. i think he people, doesn't come across i think people have a respect for the way he fought the campaign mm. that having you know set himself that brief to do then he went out there and he worked extremely hard but the problem was as i say the people didn't basically take to him but he was not pushing the right message that people were interested yeah. in. But Europe. also, do you think he lives in the shadow of that uh, Conservative Party conference uh, appearance on the platform with Mrs. Thatcher when he was 17? And they remember that <laughs> yes, little schoolboy. Uh, uh, there's always been that feeling, and I mm. think this was another problem, you see. Mrs. Thatcher making these interventions in the campaign did two things. It reminded people of the worst aspects of Thatcherism, like the poll tax, point one, and it reminded them of those scenes when he took over. You know, I'm quite a good backseat driver, she yeah. said, mm -hmm. do you remember? And I think people felt, look, that's of the past, and the problem with the Tory campaign, right the way through, in my view, was that it has that backward-looking feel about it. Okay. Yeah, well, she called him the young pit back in 17. Didn't she? Oh, now no. he's feeling the pits this morning, <laughs> unfortunately. Unlike Charles Kennedy, uh, who in most people's opinion had uh, a good campaign, we're over now to the Liberal Democrats headquarters and Rachel Ward there. Morning, Rachel. You're on, Rachel. Hello, Rachel. Hi, Rachel. Obviously, uh, we can see Rachel. Rachel can't hear us, but... Uh, that's TV, as they say, folks. What about the Lib Dems, Michael? Well, everybody's saying they had a wonderful campaign. Yes, they did. It was, was pretty good. It was very straightforward. They have not done as spectacularly well, mm. though, as people imagine. 46 up to about 52. Mm. It's good. Yes, they've held their seats. But, you know, people were talking about them getting into the 60s and the 70s, yeah. and they haven't quite made it. And that. the South and the Southwest is where they always clean well, up when they're going the to. The important thing is that they've held most, almost all the seats that they, they had before. So their base is still there. They've uh, increased it a little bit. One spectacular up upset, of course, with Jackie Ballard in Taunton. But that was uh, coloured very much by hunting there. She's very strongly anti-hunting, and of course it's hunting country down there. Yeah, you know, isn't but, it, just? But Charles Kennedy, I mean, he was saying, you know, we are uh, the Lib Dems, we are now the serious party of opposition, which clearly they're not. And we're going to put a penny on tax. I think that was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I mean, there may be the feeling that people now are prepared to warm to this. I mean, yeah. everybody knows that Labour will put taxes up, because that's their record. Mm. They seem, though, to accept, but they seem to accept it, don't they? Mm. You remember what happened with petrol everybody was having this massive protest they cut it just a little bit uh, back uh, with the government then mm. saying well we've got to find the money somehow and that seemed to satisfy people so yeah. I think people are getting a bit sophisticated about and it so, and so from the Lib Dems point somewhere. of view it's it's not so much party of opposition is back to coalition is it well no definitely not back to coalition because the one thing that this has done for them 
is to make them realize, and Charlie Kennedy has expressly said this, that he wants to put distance. He's not going to be in any way seen as a poodle or anything of that yeah. sort. And is serving notice that he's not happy uh, about the way some of the things are. He's deeply unhappy, for example, about all this talk of extra private involvement in the health service. And he says he's going to fight Mr. Blair on that. All right. Well, we're off to uh, Wales now, Michael, to see what the night held for yeah. them. Jackie Kebler is there in Cardiff. Morning, Jackie. Good morning. Hello there. Yes, as in the rest of the country, a fantastic night for Labour in Wales. Their biggest win was in Anglesey, where Plaid Cymru have held the seat for 14 years. Anglesey now this morning waking up to its first Labour MP since 1979. Also had a good win at Conwy, where Plaid Cymru had a shock win at the National Assembly election, so Labour did well to take that from them. Also, they won uh, the seat of uh, Clwyd West and also retained the Vale of Clwyd, and that's the constituency, of course, where John Prescott threw that now infamous punch. Liberal Democrats, they did okay, retained their two seats in Wales. Plaid Cymru, a bit of a disappointing night for them losing that seat in Anglesey. However, they did manage to gain one seat from Labour. That was in Carmarthen East and Dinefa, so they still have four seats here in Wales. So they're probably pretty pleased with themselves this morning. However, the Conservatives, similar picture as the rest of the country, I think. They may have managed to take a seat in Scotland, but for the second term, no Welsh Conservative MPs, I'm afraid. OK, Jackie, thanks very much indeed. From Wales, we now go north of the border. Jane Chilton joins us live from Edinburgh to give us the update on the situation on Scotland as you wake up there this morning. Good morning, Jane. Good morning, Eamon. Well, all I can say is it was perhaps a predictable night for Labour. They had a tremendous night. They managed to hold on to all 56 seats that they gained in the last election. That's 56 seats out of 72. But the real story has uh, been with the Tory party. If you remember in the last election, they were wiped off the political map up here in Scotland. Uh, but tonight, uh, overnight, sorry, they actually claimed back uh, the Galloway seat from the SNP. But there was a humiliating defeat for the Conservative president, that's the Malcolm Rifkind, uh, because he failed to uh, regain his East, P East Pentland seat. Uh, Labour again took that back from him. Now, uh, the Tories also failed to get Eyre, Eastwood and Stirling. They were the three uh, Tory seats that they were really targeting and hoping to claim back. Now, the Lib Dems, they had uh, a great, huge majority for um, Charles Kennedy, the party leader, but they ended up losing two seats in total. And as for the uh, um, SNP, they lost one seat. So I think to summarise, it was a predictable landslide for Labour, but the Tories seem to have got one foothold back in the political situation in Scotland. Thanks, Jane. And it right. looks uh, a nice morning in Edinburgh today. Um, nice morning here in London.